So I've been using ChatGPT for the past two months and uh, I'm a software programmer and uh, now every day 80% of my work uh, in terms of coding is all generated code by ChatGPT and some other AI code generation tools uh, that I incorporate with ChatGPT but mostly it's been ChatGPT. And it's amazing how it just completely transformed the way I work every day. And um, throughout this journey, I felt both excited, uh, relieved, because some of the coding that I do every day, I just don't feel like doing because it's repetitive and I've been doing it for almost 20 years. Um, so relieved, excited, but at the same time scared um, because I could see how in some cases, when I tell it to code something, it actually codes better than me and I get to learn from it while I'm using it. So with all these feelings inside of me, I finally took the time to let's uh, like let's get to know how it works, how it's built, and how it's how it works. Um, technically, I would like to know the details, but also very high level. Like I don't want to get into the maths or anything like that. I just want somebody to explain to me at a very high level in sort of a like a dummy language, layman's terms. Explain to me how it's built, how the scientists are building it, and um, uh, yeah, how it's basically produced. And I couldn't find anything online that did it really well. So I went, spent a lot of time learning it and I decided to make a video of my own that's a complete beginner's guide in terms of how ChatGPT is researched, how it's dis discovered and built and developed and released to us so that everybody can use. So uh, let's get right into it. So ChatGPT for beginners. And um, I'm gonna put these slides in the description of my video. And there, there is my YouTube channel there. So you can share it if you want with somebody else and use this slide if you want. So what is ChatGPT and why it shocked the world? So ChatGPT is a conversational AI that is capable of carrying out an intelligent conversation with a human. So you can think of this as almost like the scene from Iron Man in the Marvel movies where the Iron Man goes, hey Jarvis, I need to build this and this. Can you run some diagnostics on, on this and this? And Jarvis goes like after two seconds, and then it's like, here's the results. And then the Iron Man is like, Oh, that's surprising. Can you look more in, more into that in more detail? And then Jarvis goes, okay, sure. And then he does more research and then comes back. And they collectively work together in a conversation and then they build this thing together, right? So uh, that means AI is now able to have like intelligent, like human-like conversations with other, another human. So AI research ha itself has been around for almost like 80 years. So it's a pretty old uh, field, but the conversational and also during this time, everybody tried to crack this conversational AI and everybody failed. It, it turned out to be an incredibly diff uh, difficult task to do. And the, um, the, the reasons why this is difficult is our natural language, like English, you know, I speak Korean, um, I mean, whatever, whatever other languages you speak, they're not precise language, like mathematics. Um, you, when you're talking um, in natural languages, they're f they're, they are full of nuances both in the grammatical structure of the language. So uh, the, sequence of, the sequence in which the words appear in the sentence matter. And then depending on the context of what you're talking about, the meaning of the same word that's pronounced the same way uh, are different. So you have to really listen to the whole context, whole explanation of what you're talking about in order to interpret each word. And this is, this is exactly why it's known to be quite difficult even for humans to be able to fully develop their brain and and be able to carry on a, in, a like intelligent conversation with an, another, and this is why it really takes human baby, babies a long time to to learn to speak and have a conversation. So when ChatGPT was able to carry on such a conversation, and in some cases for certain topics it could do so better than humans, uh, it really gave a lot of feelings inside, emotions inside um, the humans, um, like things like um, they're, they're, they feel amazed at this, excited and scared. And these emotions, uh, you can get a better kind of control of them once you get to know the limitations of what ChatGPT is capable of and not capable of. Because, you know, even if you're excited, you don't want to be overexcited and get disappointed to find out the limitations later. If you're scared, you, you might need, you don't need to be scared, but you're needlessly getting scared because you don't know what it's capable of and what it's not capable of. You're just kind of scared, right? So let's get to the details of how it works. And then once we understand how it works, then we can kind of understand what is capable of and not capable of and some of the differences clear differences between AI and human beings so that so then you know all of these emotions get cleared cleared out so how did the AI scientists crack this conversational AI so the it turns out the only animal right that can 
do this massive, you know, uh, processing of natural language and having a conversation is humans, really. We're the only animals that can do this on, on planet Earth. So scientists decided to uh, basically say, right, so if we can't manually model this with math mathematics, let's literally just take a look at how our brain works and then simulate that in computer and let's see what happens. So uh, this also, this program, right, is uh, completely reactionary. And I say that because once you build this program, computer program that's simulating our brain, it's kind of sitting there and waiting in a computer server because it, and then it waits until it's thrown into a certain conversation. So some user logs into ChatGPT website and then starts typing like a paragraph or paragraphs of something that they want to talk about with the ChatGPT. And then at that moment, it takes all that text data that user literally typed on their keyboard, runs it through the program, and then gives out an output of a response. So it's completely reactionary. It's sitting there and waiting to react. Okay, so there's that input part, and then there's the generated response part, input, output. So that's all the AI program is. So let's go back a little bit and how the scientists begin tackling, uh, like looking at our brain. So this is a guy who won the Nobel Prize. He, what he did was uh, he took a rat's brain, he sliced it thin, very thinly, and then he dropped the watercolor so that he can better visual, visually see the structure of the brain slices. So he would just put that slice under the microscope and he would observe different parts of the brain. And what turned, uh, what seemed to be pretty random structure, so what you see here is you've got neurons and then in between the neurons, the neurons are basically like, you could think of them as cells. And in between the neurons, these cells, there's a thin connection where the electricity um, signals travel. And this is why when you see MRI scans, you see like lighting up of this, this complex structure in the MRI scan. It's because there's an electrical signal traveling through these neurons. And th are these neurons just randomly connected? That's what I thought in the beginning, but it turns out there's different patterns that emerge. So depending on the part of the brain that's you know dedicated for memory, let's say, uh, it's structured in a certain way. Uh, if there's a part of the brain that's dedicated for logical thinking, logical processing, then it's structured in a different way. Uh, the actual neurons are the same, but their connections uh, look in some parts of the brain like this, and then some other parts of the brain, it looks something different. And that's what he found out, and uh, um, I, th I don't exactly know what exactly he did to win the Nobel Prize, but that's, these are the, some of the uh, observations that he made. So in reality, neurons are connected with each other in 3D space. So because when you look at our brain, it looks like a 3D object like this, right? And if you look, you know, into it, they look like this here. And you've got neurons connected in all directions surrounding one neuron. And then um, the connections are like these thin connections that you can see. And what you see is like, let's say a brain is like this here, and then you give input signals from all parts of your body. So your eyes, your touches from your fingers, uh, your smell from your nose, everything is converted into um, electrical signals from their you know, sensing point, like fingers or nose, uh, smell receptors, whatever. Um, and then there's a visual uh, optical re receptors in our eyes. Whatever it is, we our body parts receive that, and then it will convert that into electrical signals and then send it to your brain. And your brain, what the neurons do is when the input signals reach the brain, there's the initial input receiving neurons. And then when the signals hit them, they they get activated and then they sort of propagate the next signals to the next connecting neurons. And then you see like this lighting up, like if you look at the brain lighting up, like sending signals to from one neuron to another, you have the input neurons getting activated first. And then you see like an animation of like, you know, the lights going on in your brain and they light up in different patterns even if you receive the same visual kind of uh, signals from your eyes depending on what you're looking at if you're looking at a beach versus you're looking at a mountain whatever your brain even though um, ultimately they're coming from the same source um, your eyes are sending different kind of strength of signals and then your brain kind of lights up in different ways um, so how do we it's very complex it's way too complex and especially too complex to program this in computers. So how did computer scientists then simplify this into a very, very simple model, right? So forget about all the connections. Let's just take a look at one single neuron. How can we boil it down to a simple concept? So they basically took this one neuron 
and they started with, let's say, one input. Neurons can have multiple inputs into it, but let's just talk about just one input here. And here, the input, you can receive electrical signals from, let's say, from zero to nine. Zero being very weak and nine being very strong a signal. You get a, a, a signal that's three, and then this neuron, this particular neuron, every neuron behaves and activates differently. But this particular neuron, when it receives three, it activates and it outputs uh, 519 because it's got three connections to three other neurons. So at the end of this connection, there's other neurons here, right? So this neuron is going to get five, signal five. Even though this neuron received sig uh, signal three, this neuron is going to receive five, this neuron is going to receive one, and this neuron is going to receive nine. So if we have just many, many, many neurons like this, and they, they're all connected in the computer program, right? Are we mimicking what the brain is doing? Yes. And depending on, so you've got not just one input neuron, but you've got multiple input neurons, and then you simultaneously send signals to it, they're all going to light up. And then you have the output neurons at the end that will also be activated and then give you human understandable answers at the end. So let's talk about that. So one of the most successful AI case that really AI became a thing is image recognition. Um, and this is where we started seeing the importance of using neural networks. What the scientists did basically is they had a set of images, thousands and thousands of images of dogs, birds, and cats. Okay. And then what they want to see is basically when they present this picture of a bird and then they kind of convert it into electrical signals into the initial input layer where they have, in this case, it's a very small neural network, but this is just to kind of demonstrate to you what it, what it would look like. But in reality, in order to understand a, an image like this, you would have like thousands and uh, hundreds of, um, uh, you could potentially have hundreds of neurons. I don't know, maybe this many neurons is good enough to um, decipher dog, bird, cat. I'm not sure, whatever. You've got an input layer, and then they will all decide to light up and activate and then pass on signals to the next layer. And then they would also decide to pass on signals to the next layer, next layer. And then at the end, because as humans, we're interested in only three types of answers. Dog, just tell me either this is a dog, bird, or cat. So we've got three neurons at the end. And then the question is, what kind of signals, given the input image, what kind of signals do we get for a neuron that's responsible for an answer for the dog, or the bird, or the cat? And hopefully, our hope is that given the image of a bird, we get a very strong signal coming out of this neuron that's responsible for bird. And then we get very weak signals uh, for neurons that are responsible for dog and cat. So then we can safely say as a human being, okay, this AI, tell me what this is. And then, oh, it's a bird, right? So what is a training of an AI? We hear this all the time that people talk about, like ChatGPT had to be trained, right? So like I said, we have thousands of images of dog, bird, and cat. Initially, you have um, these neurons that are connected. In this case, one neuron has um, a connection to every single other neurons in the next layer. And then this one, let's say, is connected to every single other uh, neuron in the next layer as well. And um, initially, when you have when you input an image of a bird, right, they all travel. Remember, some neurons will decide to activate, and some neurons will only decide to activate to maybe from here to this one, this one, and this one, and then ignore this one and this one. It's it's all random in the beginning. So you st start with a very random uh, neural network. You give it an image of a bird, and it gives you the answer of dog. That's usually what happens when you start randomly. And it will give you the wrong answer every single time, right? And um, the the idea is then you have a training uh, data set of, like, let's say, 1,000 pictures of dog, bird, and cat. And then every time it gives a wrong answer, you basically um, tell the neural networks uh, that was not the right answer. So you need to change your activation behavior a little bit. So uh, they will all change their activation behavior, and then you will feed in the images again, and then test, like, are, is it, are you giving the right answer or not? And then you just keep on doing that over and over until they begin to more or less start to give the right answer at the end. So then, whatever it is doing inside, right, uh, what seem to be purely random activations now become, like, um, be start to have, like, um, certain patterns. So... So if you fit in a picture of a dog, then you would have like certain neurons lighting up that would eventually lead to this lighting up 
and give you the answer of dog. So that's what it means to be training. You really have to just start with a random set of neural network and connections and activations, and then you just keep on reiterating and telling it you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong until oh you start you you, you start to get the answer right. Okay, do more of that, do more of that, and then it will just eventually the activations and connections are the smarts inside of an AI. So in this particular design of a neural network, where you have initially input layers and then next layer of neurons, ne and then uh, activating next layer of neurons, activating next layer of neurons, and then eventually activating output layer of neurons, is particularly good for image recognition. But it, this this particular neural network pattern, it, it's it miserably fails in other tasks, especially like natural language, like if you want to have a conversation. So what the scientists realize, um, and there's a lot of, um, I think Google is like the most uh, advanced AI uh, scientist. It's not even OpenAI who made ChatGPT. Actually, OpenAI scientists learn from Google papers. So what the Google people realize is that, right, we can come up with not just a sim one pattern of neural, neural networks. We can kind of structure it so that sometimes you could even have a output of a neural network feeding back to the earlier layer. That's that's kind of crazy, right? Here, here you you just see one direction, like from from left to right, and then eventually you get an answer. But instead of that, they they kind of figured sometimes you can even loop back into your own neuron, or you can send send the signal back and feed it into the previous layer. So then then the the answers you get out of that starts to become very interesting. And they found out these different patterns of the sort of networking of the neurons, um, and a lot of it is also based on our own. Uh, observing our neurons in the brain. They look at, okay, how is the neurons in our brain kind of connecting itself? Is it really truly just unidirectional from left to right, like like this simple case? That's not the case. Our neurons in our brains are very complex and they kind of m make connections to other neurons. And then that, that neuron five or seven steps down the, down the road also connects back to this neuron and it's all jumbled up and it's crazy, right? So they also simplified all that patterns, crazy patterns, and came up with some of the patterns that seem to be working pretty well in computer program. I don't know too much about this. I mean, it seems like the red is the output neurons where you get the final answer, and the yellow is the input neurons where you initially hit with the initial input data, and whatever is in the, in, in the middle just do their crazy magic. I, I don't know the details of these, uh, but the important thing is these, a lot of these patterns are borrowed from our biological brain. Right, so I just want to make sure, uh, depending on the, the networking of the neurons, you can have very simple behavior and al also very complex behavior. That's all we need to understand here from here. Now then, how did ChatGPT come about, right? So this is a paper from Google scientists, and I don't understand this either, so uh, I'm not going to try to explain it in detail. But on the left-hand side, what they did was, that's the initial part where when the humans actually type in the input like chat message it would come and hit the initial part of the chat gpt's neural network that tries to understand what's going on and try to understand the context of of the input and then the next part is generating the answer so they've broken it down into understanding what's uh, the input understanding the input and then the next second part is generating the answer so that's how they did it but i'm guessing uh the neural networks that are involved in here and here are like based on very complex pattern. Nothing, nothing like this simple is going to be a very complex pattern. But then it's also the way you um, train them. So basically, so it's very similar to how humans go through learning. So human babies, they learn to speak the language even before they go through formal education in school. So you can see babies at seven years old, eight years old. They they start start talking to their mom and dad, uh, but they do it in a very um, unprofessional way, that, like uneducated way, like very rudimentary, but they can still communicate. But how are they doing that? It's not like mom and father are sitting there teaching grammar to the kid. Mom and dad just kind of speak to them. Their uncle, aunt, whatever, other human beings all speak to that baby. And they all talk about different things to the baby. Sometimes they're talking about the TV show. Sometimes they're talking about like buying a chocolate from a supermarket, whatever. Whatever the topics may be, the human baby is kind of sitting there and just receiving all these information from different hum other adults. And then they start to find patterns in their brain. And that's their com complex neurons here, what you see, um, forming connections with other neurons. And then if that was a mistake, they would dis disconnect it and then they would form it with another neurons. And then also they would change the activation behavior. 
right? So all of that development is happening inside of the, the baby's brain, but it's completely unsupervised. Nobody is guiding uh, the kid what is right and what is wrong. The baby is just kind of taking it all in and then speak out to test um, uh, the baby's current current baby's uh, brain state. And then if the, if the feedback from the uh, adults are not what they expect, then they would just feel stressed and that causes the brains to like disconnect with the current connections of the neurons and then reorganize itself and then test it out again in the real world and that process repeats over and over just like how the scientists are training a, what seems to be a very random simulated neural network and then they keep on training that baby is doing the same thing so before going to school they go through all this unsupervised basically fine pattern in chaos phase and then they enter school and then they f formally get educated and this is with very strict guidance and the school tells the kid either from the teacher or the exam scores the school tells the kid um, what is a better answer and what is a worse answer and this is a completely supervised learning right and this is the fine tuning so most of the work has already been done with the unsupervised run uh, learning by taking all this complex information and the baby can find patterns rough patterns of what they what the conversation is about but then the school is like an icing on top. It just basically takes that and then fine tunes the baby's brain with, with a guidance, guidance based education. ChatGPT does exactly the same thing. So the part of the brain, the neural networks in ChatGPT that has to understand the context of what's being talked about, when they're training that uh, neural networks, there's no human involvement. They just gather all kinds of information from the internet and then just throw it at the, um, uh, the neural networks and then uh, the neural networks will kind of start to ha find rough patterns, right? So this set of um, blog posts, I think it's talking about something related to like tech. This, I think it's talking about like, I don't know, traveling. I think this is talking about, I don't know, human, uh, like a marriage relationships, whatever. It start to find these patterns and group the blog posts and all the texts. Well, OpenAI claims that they scraped all the text websites and blog posts and everything that is text-based they scraped it everything from the internet and they just dumped it right into this neural network so this this neural network it was completely um uh trained unsupervised and it can find patterns uh given any input text that uh that the user from on ChatGPT website they start writing whatever they want to talk to ChatGPT, and when that input comes in uh, that neural network uh, it, it can find patterns and context of what exactly that person is talking about like really fast. So that's like almost like a, what a kid does, right? And then the actual answering part to, you know, talk back to response back to the human on ChatGPT website, that's on a task of an, another neural network that has been completely trained with human supervision. So what that means is they OpenAI literally hired thousands and thousands of people, right? And then the outputs of the the context understanding neural network will be the input to the response generating neural network, right? So right, so this is like I, now I understand what this person is talking about in the chat, right? Now here's here's how I understood them. So that becomes the outputs of what they understood becomes the input to the response generating neural network, and then the response generating neural network will give out a certain response in text right because it's a chatbot at the end of the day and that text has been read and judged and scored by humans so this is like equivalent to school teachers in schools and then the human judges will basically say no that's that's an illegal answer like you can't sometimes it's flat out wrong and then the human is like that's a wrong answer uh like i don't know one plus one is not three it's two like the humans are actually telling the chat gpt you're wrong and then once it corrects itself, and also there's there's other cases where ChatGPT would give an answer to how to kill another human being, and then the human judge will be like, you don't have morals, okay? So you cannot give these kind of answers, reject. So with these kind of supervision, the response generation uh, neural network is basically, the, they're able to kind of learn the ethics, learn the morals, everything, and start to uh, put out like a human-like responses. So it's important to understand there's two uh, by and large, two uh, neural networks going on inside of ChatGPT, okay? So current state of ChatGPT, for unsupervised learning, the the, uh, the understanding of the input part, that neural network takes in, like I said, all the text data from the internet up to year 2021, and to train that neural network by dumping in all these blog posts and all the texts, um, it takes about one year. That's crazy. You basically have like this, training program 
tweaking the connections and activations of all the neurons in this neural network that understand that they're supposed to understand the input endlessly 24 7 running on vast vast number of gpus for the course over the course of one year and then uh, the actual response uh, generating part where the human judges are involved uh, that takes about six months just working humans i guess i guess the humans work nine to five in that case right they have set because humans get tired right and then that takes about six months so once these two parts of the neural networks are trained and and complete right uh it serves the customers which are the users of chat gpt website we just literally go there and just type in chat it serves customers for a period of time until a new version is released so they're working on gpt4 and i don't know how long gpt gpt4 my guess is that they're going to follow the same pattern so there's the neural networks for understanding uh the context of the input chat and then there's a neural networks for the generating the response and i i don't know how many neurons and how many connections they're going to use they say they're going to use way more by the way the more connections and more neurons you use in the simulated these programs neural networks the smarter the ai gets um when you compare that to how many the number of neurons and connections that humans humans have in our kind of organic cells we have way way more way way more i i heard something like we have like 10,000 10,000 10, 1,000 10,000 more number of neurons uh, anyways is way more than what we simulate at the uh, at the current time with the chat gpt but chat gpt 4 which is the next version is supposed to have way more neurons and connections so it's supposed to be more um, sophisticated so in between the releases really these neural networks that are trained that they're set in stone and they're fixed they're, they don't change so let's compare chat gpt and humans now that we understand what actually is uh, involved in in simulating our brain and creating this uh, artificial AI intelligence we can start to see the limitations and uh, what it's good at and what it's not good at humans need to spend about 25 years to have fully developed brain right like which means more or less the the the, the neurons activation and the connections it makes with other neurons they're stabilized right when you take a kid the disconnection connection and all these changes that are happening in these neurons it's very rapid and it's radically changing all the time there's even a case where a cat was uh, got into an accident and the surgeon took out half of its brain because it had to be cut out and the rest of it the, the cat's brain because it was a small kitten like a small baby the kitten ki kitten's brain was able to reorganize itself completely to take on the responsibility responsibility of the other missing half of the brain with the you know one half of the brain that survived so that's amazing but they took a same case with a mature cat where the mature cat got into an accident and we had they had to carve out a part of the brain to to you know hopefully the cat survives and the mature cat's brain could not reorganize and it died right so uh for humans it requires about 25 years the neurons are always changing in our, in our human body even after it's fully developed we are constantly um, having these minor tweaks <laughs> so it's very fluid our neurons uh, disconnect and connect and change its activation behaviors and like it, it always changes every second we live um, and our neurons are completely autonomous and super energy efficient what it means is it decide each every single individual neurons decide to make changes necessary changes uh, to itself by itself without any kind of a governing body it will get external stimulus some kind of signal will come and it will be like oh I should disconnect this one now but all that decision making is being made being made at the cellular level and because it's organic hardware neurons are just cells right so it's super energy efficient like there's electrical signals flowing my body right now but these are very tiny tiny electrical signals and the transferring of this electricity is very very efficient in our body because probably our body is made up of like liquid and stuff like that i don't know and all you have to do is just i don't know just bite into a potato eat it and then you feel your body um, and then your body just kind of works on low energy you know uh, but chat gpt on the other hand it takes 1.5 years to be trained and released as a version which is like a um, upper hand compared to human human has to spend 25 years um, ai right now chat gpt 1.5 years is going to get faster and faster but for now it's 1.5 years if you compare 1.5 years to 25 years of course you, you just want to spend 1.5 years and that's because you know that's the the advantage of simulation right you don't want you don't have to live out your entire life you can just simulate it and then just run it quickly in your program in a computer program and chat gpt doesn't change its neural network once it's built unlike human beings real brains and there's 
a lot of researches that are happening right now to make that change, to make it less uh, rigid. So in between the releases, uh, ChatGPT version, let's say one, and then version two, uh, in between the releases right now, um, it's fixed. But then during the course of ChatGPT1 being used by the users, maybe we don't want to restructure the whole thing too much, but if the user, while entering the conversation, user says, you're incorrect, you know, you're wrong. Actually, this is the right way. And then the user gives the feedback. And then that becomes a feedback for training the what it's right now is a fixed version of ChatGPT, but it will be able to pick that up and make minor changes in its neural networks. And um, that's being researched right now. But for now, you can kind of assume a vast majority of that neural network is kind of fixed and it's you just have to wait for the next release for the AI to be smarter and smarter. And ChatGPT, of course, um, you've seen these days, a lot of people are using it and the website is constantly down or slow. That means it requires massive amounts of electricity to run these servers and it requires um, a lot of GPUs to train the neural networks and all these things eats up a lot of energy at the moment. I think AI is consuming um, a lot of electricity right now. I wouldn't be surprised if they're spending like, I don't know, 30%, 40% of an entire US state electricity consumption into AI in some tech driven states or even more percentage than that. It's just massive, right? So yeah, so that's basically it. So what that means is in a nutshell, current AI is very rigid, right? Just because of the way the simulated neurons work right now, it's very fixed and rigid. It's very, it consumes a lot of energy. So as humans, having these brains of our ours as, as the hardware, what's under the hood, we have clear advantage. We, we, are, we can be autonomous, uh, independent, intelligent, intelligent beings uh, that doesn't have to be hooked up to a massive server. We, we, you can throw somebody into a deserted um, island and that person will figure his way out uh, using his intelligence to survive, make decisions, face problems, solve problems on a remote location without being connected to anything else. If that person's brain needs to function, just grab a potato and eat it, right? And you get energy and then you just function. So if you want to send out a, a explore, exploration team to outer space, I don't know, it humans probably will be um, very adaptable and they can run on very low energy fuels and they can make very intelligent decisions. Um, but Maybe that'll change in the future, like the movie Pr Prometheus. But anyways, for now, those are the big differences. And uh, hopefully um, this video can encourage some people who thought ChatGPT, like some, some I don't know, some young computer scientists out there who, who genuinely got excited about ChatGPT and then started researching about ChatGPT and overwhelmed by these scientific papers and mathematics and all these. Hopefully this video really made it simple uh, and then encouraged some young people to kind of take the next step from this presentation to start learning about all the bits and pieces that I explain at the high level, go deeper, learn the math, um, and all the things related to neural networks and, you know, make our lives better with AI. Thanks.